you know, as Jordan mentioned, uh, you know, our big goal is that you're going to be able to come away with understanding why we do what it is what we do. And uh, what we really feel is, is if you have a philosophy and a system in place for how you train athletes and you understand your why, uh, then, the, then the what will fall into place nice and easy. And then depending upon how much time you have in your logistics and where you are, uh, you can just make those decisions pretty simply and it'll make sense for you. Uh, I was working with a team, one of my teams yesterday, where we were doing some agility training before practice and I asked the coach, hey, how much time do I have? And he's like, dude, we're out here for two hours and practice is light, we're on you. Like, take as much time as you want. Sweet. Uh, whereas there was another team that I worked with where the coach, I would train them, warm up the team before their game and the coach would say, when the clock hits 60 and starts ticking down, you go and I need them ready to be done with you by 49. So you got 11 minutes to do whatever you want. So it's important to have a, a philosophy in place because like I said, then it just becomes, okay, what do I know needs to be done and why? And then what exercises am I gonna do to accomplish that and then send them on their way? Um, and one of the things that, that we kind of do is we'll kind of, we'll look at uh, training on a continuum, um, anything that we're trying to do, whether it's warm up, whether it's speed and agility training, strength training, energy system development, uh, we look at that as just one long kind of continuum and spectrum. And something that, that Jordan and I both learned from, uh, from our time, we had the opportunity to, to work at Coach Mike Boyle's facility in Boston. Uh, he, he talked about um, basically the training process from start to finish ultimately being we're, we're, we're impacting tissues in different ways. So if we look at it through that lens, a warm-up is going to begin with something like tissue uh, tissue quality and tissue temperature, then getting into low load tissue activation to make sure that certain muscle groups are firing properly. And then that uh, further along that continuum with, with more dynamic work, we're starting to get into tissue tolerance, whether it's speed and agility training through dynamic fast movements, strength training, tissue tolerance, and then energy system development. That's also a form of tissue tolerance or endurance, I guess you could say. So, Having said that, we look at our warm-up progression to be pretty similar in the beginning. Whether we're going to be doing strength training or energy system development or speed and agility training, and then once we get into the higher end of that warm-up process and further along that continuum, then it's going to look a little bit more specific towards what we're going to do. So if we're doing strength training or if we're doing speed and agility training, uh, the very beginning stages of that warm-up process are going to look pretty similar. Uh, Next, I think you know, Jordan kind of mentioned this, uh, and some of the other people have talked about this earlier today to kind of set the framework. A lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about is is being trying to be brilliant at the basics. Um, I think Mark talked a little bit about it, and if you heard his talk, how many people are early specializing uh, in uh, in hockey? Um, Jeff talked about it a little bit. I know, and, and Chris was going over some of the exercises earlier today with uh, just you know being really good at simple basic exercises. Um, you know, in this day and age with YouTube and Instagram and all that stuff, everyone wants to be like doing all kinds of cool stuff. But in this day and age, we really feel that like cutting edge is just doing stuff really well, doing basic stuff really well. So once we've gone over the concepts, uh, those kind of the what, the why, and the, or the, the why and the when, you'll be able to plug in your own what. You know, there's a million glute activation drills. There's a million T-spine mobility drills. We'll show you a couple and then common technique flaws that we see and how you can coach them. But really that kind of is what would be up to you. Um, and the cool thing about these kinds of conferences is you can hear our approach and if you like it, awesome. You can go ahead and take this stuff with your with your athletes or, or clients on Monday and if you don't like it, that's cool too. Flush it, it's okay. Um, but this is just what we do and this is why. So going back to the idea of, uh, of, of impacting tissues, the first thing that we're gonna wanna do in our training sessions if we have the opportunity to is to work on tissue quality. So for us, that's doing things like foam rolling or some sort of self myofascial release. Um, we really want to be able to put this in the category of needs to be done, but the reality is uh, you might not be able to because you don't have the equipment for it. If I have to go out and warm up my baseball team uh, with 36 guys out on the field, I don't have foam rollers, so I'm not going to be able to do that. And that's one of the things I, I think is really important to always just keep remembering is that logistics always win. I remember um, talking to someone one time that was trying to get advice about programming, and he was like, oh man, like I, I love box jumps. Box jumps are just the best. Like I've, I've really got to do them, but like I, I need your, I need your help. Like the only problem is I, I don't have any boxes. So how do I, do, how do I do them? And it's like, well, 
I guess you're not going to do box jumps. You, you can find, find, so you find some other way. So again, the box jumps just being the what, but more of the, uh, you know, the, the why or the how is what we need to focus on there. Um, so self-myofascial release, foam rolling, if you haven't, absolutely. That's going to be step one in our process, and the reason is because we're able to see changes in someone's movement quality right away after doing foam rolling. You can improve, if you're familiar with the functional movement screen or that sort of thing, you can improve someone's active straight leg raise or hip mobility pretty much right away. So our thought process is, if you can improve movement quality with something simple like foam rolling, then we're going to do it. We'll take three to five minutes to work on common areas that will typically be tight and especially ones that impact the hips in all the different planes of motion. So we're going after quad, hip flexors, glutes, uh, adductors, uh, if you have the time for it. Uh, next along the line, we're gonna look at uh, trying to start to get a tissue temperature and, uh, and low load tissue activation. We kind of liken uh, the idea of activation work to being uh, trying to turn up the dimmers on the lights in the room. So if you go into a living room and uh, you, know, you walk in and, uh, and the lights are all down, uh, they've got those dimmers that go up and down. It's kind of what happens with some of the different muscle groups that are important for proper movement and performance. So we want to always try and make sure that we're activating certain muscle groups. So along those lines, we're gonna, the, the primary things that we're going to try and make sure that for, for warm up that we're going to be activating are going to be glute max to really make sure that it's aiding and, and driving hip extension, uh, glute med, uh, and rotator cuff. Those are going to be the couple of the ones that, that are important to us. So that's we're starting to get into that process of, uh, of tissue te of tissue temperature a little bit by uh, by warming us warming the core temperature up a little bit and getting uh, some some low load tolerance. Then we're going to do mobility work because what we want to do is, is further that tissue temperature and optimize movement patterns. So the way that we're going to look at mobility training after our activation work is if, if you're familiar with uh, with the physical therapist Gray Cook. He talks about this concept of the joint by joint approach in that the body is essentially a, a, a series of joints stacked upon one another that have alternating knees. So if we're going from the ground up, you can go, you can go even more detail than this, but to keep it you know, just to a handful of them, the ankles, we want to make sure that our ankles are mobile. We have the ability to have mobile ankles. We want to have stable knees and then just alternating up the chain. So we have stable knees, we want to have mobile hips, we want to have a stable lumbar spine, mobile thoracic spine, and then stability of our scapula to be able to move properly al along the rib cage. Uh, so that's kind of how we look at our mobility training for the purposes of, uh, of working out. Now, a couple of these exercises, um, you know, you, uh, you might think like, okay, well, we're getting into, you know, shoulder mobility. We still absolutely want to do shoulder mobility if we're doing speed and agility training, because as we've seen earlier today, um, I believe a couple people talk out, you know, talked about it, how important arm action is. Uh, during during movement training. So we're still gonna do shoulder mobility even though if we're doing speed and agility, it's largely on our legs. So we've established ankle mobility, knee stability, hip mobility, uh, thoracic spine mobility, um, shoulder st uh, scapula, scapula stability along the ribcage. Um, so then having said that, we would then get into a, dyna a dynamic warm-up. This is where we kind of start to branch off a little bit. If we're just doing strength training and we only really only have like 45 minutes or so, we might not do uh, an intensive dynamic form of getting into strength. But if we're going to be doing speed and agility training, then we're going to want something that's going to better help bridge the gap between simple low load warm up exercises and then uh, high velocity multi directional you know, multi planar movements. So that's when we're going to get into a dynamic warm up. And for our dynamic warm up, what we're going to try and accomplish is getting the body moving in multiple planes of motion, getting dynamic flexibility, again, similar to the foam rolling, in the areas that are responsible for impacting the hips, and then trying to get balance work, uh, and then just looking at the different basic movement patterns that we go through, things like squat and hinging, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you, Jordan, you have Yeah, and we can, what we do sometimes is because we have a sports med staff that does all of our screening, if the screening for some reason hasn't been done within that week and we have time, and we have some time in our warm up, we can use the activation and the mobility and the dynamic warm up as a little bit of a screen on our end. That's not our scope of practice. We can still utilize that stuff. Like if we're doing like a straight leg march and we see somebody all over the place, we're flexing here. We can kind of see those things really early on in our warm up and kind of determine like maybe we should work on these things. And maybe what we do is we go watch the screen happen so that we can be like, okay, maybe that was right or I got to do better at coaching. So that's just one little tidbit for that. Cool. So, um, so that kind of establishes our. Our, our, our why, I guess, you, know, you can kind of uh, hopefully see kind of the, the thought process in terms of how we will organize the general layout of our warm-ups. 
and now we can get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty. So if you want to, you want to participate with these, you're you know you're welcome to. Just find some space on the turf. But we'll go through a couple of drills for each of these different concepts. Uh, and, and then, like I talked, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about what are common flaws that we see, coaching cues, and that sort of thing. So and then you guys, there's going to be a handout you guys will get later. So all of the stuff that we're going to go over is going to be in this handout. Okay. So. Uh, Kicking it off with activation work, Jordan's going to be uh, the demonstrator for this, and I'm going to kind of talk us through it. Uh, a couple of people have talked about it today, the importance of bridging. So now that we want some sort of activation, we're gonna, we've got a couple of different bridges to practice. Um, early, uh, as, as was talked about earlier, if you were at uh, I believe Chris's talk, uh, he was talking about this, but we do the same thing. We'll start athletes out on the ground and have their, uh, their toes pointed up like this, heels maybe you know 10 to 12 inches away from their rear. And then what I'm just going to have Jordan do is push through his heels into the ground, squeeze his glutes, hips are going to come up, he's going to stay tight in his abs. We like holding this for time for about 10 to 20, anywhere from 10 to 20 seconds. Um, and one of my favorite lines is kind of like if we're trying to get, if we're trying to get activation or stabilizers to work, give the stabilizers time to stabilize. Give the muscles time to activate um, and know that they're supposed to be working. So a two-legged hip bridge, uh, one of the things that we'll commonly see is going to be, uh, as you know, maybe may have been re referenced earlier, is uh, some sort of lumbar extension in order to get that, that pattern up, which is not what we want. Um, or driving, you know, driving through the, you know, putting more emphasis on the, on the knees, heels coming up off the ground. We'll see kids with their heels come up off the ground all the time. That's part of the reason why we're gonna immediately going to go and have toes up off the ground. So that's going to be one way that we do it. A second way that we're going to do it is to do a single leg version, and we're actually going to have Jordan grab his right, uh, his left knee. He'll go with his left knee. He's going to grab his left knee and pull it up to his chest. Now he's going to push up on through his left heel and bring his hips up and do the same thing. This does a couple of things. It's going to allow us to be able to assess, as Jordan was talking about. Uh, it's going to allow us to assess for any kind of asymmetry from one side to the other. You might see that one hips are on on one side is going to be able to get up higher than the other. Maybe that maybe one glute was a little bit stronger than the other. But the other thing that it does is that when Jordan goes into hip flexion on that side by hugging that one knee up to his chest, it's going to help us a little bit and make sure that we're going to limit the extent to which his lumbar spine can extend. So it's almost going to kind of help us force him into that proper position a little bit to make sure that the extension that he does get is going to be more likely from his glutes rather than from his low back. So just a little something there. Um, Next, uh, moving along. So we're going to do uh, like something for the glute med. All right. So we want something um, for, the, for, uh, for stability in our, in our hip, <coughs> and the glute med is important for that. So uh, one of the things that we'll do is we'll actually do some manual resistance work with a couple of these, uh, with a couple of these concepts. Uh, again, thinking about if you you might have no equipment, you might have zero equipment just in a situation like this, but we still need to get certain things done. You might be used to using mini bands. Uh, or small plates to do uh, to do certain activation exercises, but uh, I, I really feel that uh, manual resistance work is something that is is really big bang for your buck because it allows us to get uh, some work done without having to, to need any equipment. Um, and then what it also does is we'll show you in just a second. So Jordan's going to go into a sideline position here. We're going to have a straight line from his knees to his hips to his shoulders. I as his partner are going to come back here, and I'm just going to block off his low back to make sure that the movement that we get is not going to be through lumbar rotation, all right? So I'm going to put my hand right on top of Jordan's knee like this, and he's going to keep his feet stacked. I'm also just going to put his hand right at his hip to make sure that we're, we're trying to limit that motion uh, at, at his back. And he's just going to push up against my hand, and then I'm going to press back down and he resists, okay? So one benefit that this is going to give us is it's allowing us to get concentric and eccentric work through this, uh, through this process. And then he would go and switch to the other side. Because we're getting um, a pretty good amount of resistance, concentrically and eccentrically, we keep the reps fairly low, something in the neighborhood of like five or six. Um, but we would go through it like that. Uh, it allows us to make sure that resistance is, is appropriate for the individual, because the partner can just make sure that, uh, you know, hey, if, if, if they need more resistance, they can press a little bit harder. Or, you know, uh, sometimes what we'll see kids do, they'll kind of be goofy and they'll just be kind of standing there like not letting their partner like move up or whatever so you can just kind of tell them no relax like let them let them bring their leg up that's not the point um but uh it's just a big bang for your buck uh concept that, that we like to use um, a couple of the common uh faults that we've uh that we've you know already kind of talked about was you know rotating through the lumbar spine or laterally flexing in order to get that knee up so those are a couple things that we want to look out for uh the other thing i literally had to, had to yeah. coach someone through this uh earlier this this past week here back on the ground was was literally um, 
you know, them just bringing their knee up and they were just kind of going like this, just kind of like looking around and I'm like, no, 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 like slow down, do it, you know, do, like do it right. And that kind of brings us back to the original point of making sure that we're just trying, trying as best as possible to be brilliant at the basics. Some of these exercises have been like that, yeah, it's mean, like, you know, 100 times, but making sure that it's done really well in our mind is, is cutting edge. Yeah, no, for our setting too, like our kids have a really short attention span, so the more that we can hammer home these small things and build a really good foundation, it's going to allow us to do more as they go along and get older. Good choice. Perfect. Um, so uh, moving along, uh, in activation, the one or one I didn't uh, didn't mention earlier that we want to try and make sure that we're getting for our activation drills is that we do want to get some type of uh, hip flexor activation. Specifically, we want to try and get after uh, the psoas, the iliacus. So um, it's, it is common that we'll like you know, possibly have tight hip flexors, but uh, the psoas and iliacus are important for being able to flex the hip above 90 degrees. And if those muscles aren't activated, if they're inhibited, then there might be a bigger chance that we uh, we'll, we'll substitute. Um, for, for that motion maybe with our low back or something like that. So we wanna try and make sure that we're getting our deeper, higher hip flexors activated. So one of the exercises that we're gonna do for that is just a supine isometric exercise. Again, um, not even needing any equipment, but Jordan's gonna go into hip flexion here, knee slightly above hip level, and he's just gonna press against his knee and then resist. He's also pulling this toe towards his face, and we'll get into that in just a second. But Jordan's gonna provide his own isometric ex uh, resistance here. Back is flat on the ground, so he's not extending through his lumbar spine, but he's in that hip flexion pattern, knee above 90 degrees, and then just providing resistance. Again, giving the stabilizers time to stabilize, go for about 10 to 20 seconds. Jordan can kind of attest too, if you, a, a common kind of fault that we'll see is someone will be kind of lazy and they'll just be down here like this. Doing it here, you're gonna feel it differently down at that point, as opposed to being higher up. You'll feel that in a different spot. So that's why it's important to be cognizant of where it is, or where we are in that. The thing I mentioned earlier about actively dorsiflexing his toes, even though it might seem like, well, what does this have to do with, uh, with the movement? Whenever we get the opportunity, we want to try and make sure that we're cueing our kids into active dorsiflexion. Because when we get into higher velocity movements and speed and agility work, it's going to be really important that they have active control of that. It's going to help with their force production. And, uh, and, and commonly kids will have, you know, this, we call it lazy ankle. Um, they just, you know, whether it's uh, uh, in the dynamic warm up or in uh, static postural hold, they're just not going to want to put the effort into actively dorsiflexing. The more we can do that, we figure it'll, uh, it'll help them down the road. We can't put force in the ground with the toe pointed, so that just kind of helps reinforce that too for the later on in the session. Cool. Um, one last one that we'll kind of do for, for, from an activation perspective before we get into mobility work is to try to integrate uh, core activation with hip activation that we've done. But I gotta uh, backtrack just for a second. If if you're, because Jordan here is gonna do a plank and then just add a little bit of a, of a, of a twist into it. Um, go ahead, why don't you go ahead and get on the ground in the plank position. What we try and do is make sure that our kids first properly have a, have a good plank position to begin with. So what we will tell them to do is to try and find neutral with their shoulders. We don't want them to be pressed way up and be protracted and have this curve up here. But we also don't want them to be super, uh, super dropped into their shoulders. So we'll tell them, find a neutral. And then we also want to make sure that from a, a hip perspective, he's, uh, he's engaging in his glutes, his abs are tight, and he's not uh, extended in his lumbar spine. So he's up here in a good position like this. Go ahead and relax for a second. If someone doesn't have the proper uh, you know, control or strength to do that properly, then just work on that. Even if it's just getting into a push-up position and just trying to hold a push-up position, that's fine. We kind of joke, um, you know, as we, we talked about a little bit, or some of the people talked a little bit earlier about, you know, there's early specialization. Kids can't pop stuff, uh, pop skills, jump anymore. We get kids that will come into our, our training sessions with our teams, um, and for the first, like, three weeks, we haven't even seen them out on the field or the court. And we're like, geez, who is this joker? Like, you can't even, like, like do a single leg deadlift or, like, a body weight or whatever. And, like, and then and they, they may seem like, you know, like, from a motor learn, like, motor perspective, motor program perspective, they don't really know what they're doing, but then it turns out they're like, oh, yeah, he was a high school All-American, by the way. And then you go out and see him on the court, and it's like, holy stop. Like, totally wouldn't have pegged you for that. So, having said that, this is, you know, as we, as we said, being brilliant at the basics. If, if just a simple plank is, is what they need to do, then that's fine. We'll just work on that. But if Jordan has a good plank, which I'm pretty, I'm, I'm happy with that, what he can do is just bring his leg up off the ground and go into a little bit of extension on that left side, 
and then abduction on that left side. So now we're starting to kind of combine a couple of these concepts earlier, um, core activation in the presence of glute activation and some hip motion. Right, and then also once we go into extension and or abduction, you're also going to get some isometric work on that opposite hip flex, which we're going to end up needing anyway, because again, when we're doing our sprint work and all that stuff, like we're going to have to have control of that hip flex to bring our knee up. So. We get, a, we get a lot out of that exercise, like, but, but like what Jack was saying, if they can't do just a normal plank, there's no reason for us to add any kind of distraction into it. Cool. Um, okay, so uh, moving on to, uh, to, to, to mobility. So we've done some activation work. We've given you the ideas of what we consider important for activation. So we'll go over some, uh, some mobility exercises. And again, if you want to practice any of these, feel free. Just go right ahead and jump on in, partner up with someone. Um, but for mobility, we've established that what we want to try and get is going to be ankle mobility, hip mobility, and thoracic spine mobility. Those are going to be the big three that we're going to try and make sure that we get uh, in our training sessions, whether it's speed and agility or uh, strength training. So um, ankle mobility, we, uh, one drill that we'll commonly do is we just call it three-way ankle. Uh, the reasoning is because we're going to try and just get motion uh, in, three different, in three different ways. So again, assuming I don't have any equipment, um, we're just going to partner up on this. Jordan is going to support himself up against me because what he's going to do is go into a split stance and just gently roll his foot to the outside. He's putting the majority of his weight on the back foot. It's important that that's, that's, in, that, that's established to the kids and the first thing that I explain to them is I am not trying to put pressure on that leg to go into a, a hard uh, inversion. Okay? We want to make sure that we're just getting some gentle motion. And the reason that we do this is we just want to gently roll five times because then the next motion is going to be Jordan supporting himself, keeping his heel flat on the ground, and going forward and back over his toes. And just by doing that gentle rolling to the outside, for starters, it's just going to allow for a little bit of a better slide for the over the toes. So he's going to go over the middle toe five times, and then he's going to come out over the little toe five times. So that's positions one, two, and three. So that's why we call it three-way ankle. Um, but it's key we tell the kids, and this is mistake number one probably, assuming they go in over their big toe too, we don't want to encourage a valgus position. So we commonly have to, we constantly kind of have to tell kids like, no, we don't go in over the big toe. We're going out over the middle toe and out over the little toe. And we're just trying to get motion at the joint. That's, that's really all we're trying to do. Um, so uh, a, co a coaching cue that we'll commonly use for that is just to tell kids like, hey, keep your heel flat. Don't put a ton of weight on that front leg. We're just trying to get motion there at that joint. Moving along, we're going to go with uh, a hip mobility drill, uh, kind of con uh, in conjunction with thoracic spine drill. Thora sorry, thoracic spine mobility drill. So Jordan's going to get into a lunge position, uh, lunge to instep. Uh, so some people might call this like a Spider-Man stretch or, or a Spider-Man position, but we're just calling it lunge step uh, with T-spine rotation. So Jordan's going to be in close like this. Uh, he's making sure that he's not set up too wide. If he sets up out wide like that, then it's just going to be easier for him to kind of cheat through the movement. Whereas if he gets in nice and narrow, he's going to be able to get better rotation at his T-spine um, if, he, if he held a little more honest on that. Uh, so we're getting some hip mobility uh, in, in this exercise. And then we're also getting, uh, as we talked about a little bit earlier, we're getting the opportunity to try to limit the extent to which uh, his lumbar spine gets involved in this by going into hip, by going into hip flexion on the front side. So he's going to be moving forward like this. He's going to rotate up using uh, whichever leg is forward, that arm is the one that's gonna be rotating up. Uh, another cue that we're gonna give, a big cue that we're gonna give kids on that one is eyes follow your hand or look towards the ceiling. Because in a lot of situations, vision is gonna be able to help drive our movement. So if someone just kinda stands there and goes like this, you can try it yourself even, you can just kinda go like that, as opposed to actually looking for where you're reaching, you're gonna be able to get better range of motion. So that's one of the things that we'll, uh, we'll have kids do. Uh, can, I've seen it done that way before, um, but we've 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 done it uh, with the, whichever leg is forward. That's the one that we're that was going to challenge stability a lot more. So I think for us, we're going to start off with the inside arm just because it's a little more of a stable base, and we'll definitely move to that progression if we need to for somebody. But for right now, this is perfect for us. Good question. You can you can do it either way. We like to use it, uh, and you, can, you really could do it either way, but we'll typically do it in place. Um, so that's mobility exercise, but if you're familiar, I think some of uh, dynamic, I've seen some of the I think if you're at the coordination, you can do it moving, for sure do it, but like for us, I, I really personally like it for my team just to go static because it allows them to get some type of like scat movement or scat stability while they're pulling that 
and then in the beginning of this, sometimes the floor's like getting really funky and all that kind of stuff. So for us, like we'll just keep it super simple to start and then we'll move from there. Uh, all right, so one last one that we're gonna go over uh, from a mo mobility perspective before I turn, hand it over to Jordan for the, for the dynamic warm-up piece. And the uh, race. Oh, and the race, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, what we'll typically do is we're gonna end our mobility series with some type of integrated pattern. So we saw that a little bit with uh, the lunge to instep uh, with the T-spine rotation, but we also like to add in uh, like a sumo hold uh, because what that's gonna do is we've gone over ankle mobility, hip mobility, and thoracic spine mobility. We like to try to integrate those three things together into a squatting pattern. So uh, this is actually one of the uh, situations in which actually using a little bit of weight can help because it gives the athletes um, an easier uh, ability to posteriorly weight shift and just get into the position that we want. But assuming we don't have any equipment, the way that we're gonna kind of get around that is Jordan's gonna have his feet slightly wider than shoulder width apart. He's gonna hold onto my hands like this and he's just gonna squat down and then I'm gonna give him a little bit of a support and he's just gonna have his elbows on the inside of his knees and then push out and then extend his back and try to get that nice uh, thoracic extension. He's getting a groin stretch and some thoracic spine uh, thoracic extension up here. Uh, again, in this instance, we're just trying to work on the pattern of mobility, so that's why we uh, use it that way. Uh, and it's the bottom of the squat, so again, like, bring it all together, that's the bottom of the squat position. So that's kind of where we go with it at that ending point. Is that like a three or five second hold? Or hold? Typically, you see like uh, one of two ways, either for 20 seconds, um, or I've actually programmed it for breath. Uh, I'll, I, I like the idea of programming things for breaths, but honestly, sometimes I'll see kids down there, some will hold for seven seconds, some will be down for 30, uh, when you tell them to hold it for breaths. Uh, it's just a little thing there. Uh, a lot of this stuff, mobility exercises, stretches, I think are great for breaths, but at the same time, if you've got kids, that, as Jordan mentioned, attention span, really, it's, it's the reality of if, if someone can't focus for, you know, actually deep in, inhale or exhalation, then I'll just kind of nix it and say, okay, hold for 20 seconds. So again, if you want to try and win one of those books at the end, now would probably be a good time to, uh, you know, to, to get involved maybe a little bit in like the dynamic warm-up or something. Uh, what are the two books that can win? Well, first off, there's gold coins in it, so. <laughs> there's <laughs> no, developing speed and developing the core. Both in SBA books. Great. But either way, go. Get up. This is the last we half an hour. Like 12 Somebody. to 15 go. people. Get out there. That'd be incredible.